Robert Stevenson, welcome to the Coach's Journey podcast. It's great to be here, Robbie. I love the fact that I'm Robert and you're Robbie. Do you know what? I, I, we didn't, I didn't even get to do it. Like, I was just going to, to start off the, the podcast, congratulate you on having a really great first name. Um, and also excellent initials. Um, uh, <laughs> And I, I don't know, like one of the things I was, uh, you know, I'm, I don't actually meet that many Roberts. You know, so like, I, they must exist in lots of words, but I don't often get to have a conversation one. And I've certainly never interviewed one before. So I'm excited for that. <laughs> On that alone, this is going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> of course, there are lots of other reasons why um, I'm excited as well, Robert. And, and I'm looking forward to having a really great conversation about everything coaching and whatever else, whatever else comes in. But I wondered if to start off, um, you could tell us about what was the, when was the first time you came across coaching in the way that, you know, we are going to be talking about it today? That's, that's kind of interesting. And, and I guess there's a, a roundabout answer to that because I came across coaching not by being coached or knowing a coach. I came across it by knowing a facilitator who was an amazing facilitator. So I used to do some work with an organization called Creative Partnerships. Um, my background's in theater. I uh, trained in physical theater, trained in mime, did a bit of dance along the way. Um, and a lot of the work I did was in schools, running sort of drama-based projects in schools. And I was working for an organization called Creative Partnerships and they were, uh, they teamed me up with a lady called Matilda Gilbert, who was a, a kind of, I guess she's an academic, an educational academic. And uh, we were both working together and she was doing the sort of the academic stuff around creativity and why it's important. And I was doing the practical, this is creativity from a drama perspective. And we were working in schools on, on this work. And, and looking at how could schools bring more creativity into the classrooms. That was kind of what we were looking at. And she would also run events for head teachers talking about how using creativity in schools doesn't stop you doing other things. It actually accelerates how you approach those other things. So the, the more academic stuff of, of, of being in the classroom, because often teachers were concerned with if we're doing this drama then we're not doing our English we're not doing our maths and she was talking about well, how you could combine this stuff but also how it accelerated the learning and that was something that I was very into from my sort of theatre and education work about how can you you know bring theatre as a learning tool um, and when she would have these events and she would talk to people the way that she would draw in challenging personalities was masterful and I was just like I, I I'm good um well that's what I thought at the time <laughs> being young and all of that I was like you know I'm, I'm good at this facilitation stuff but she's got something else going on here that just ramps up how she's enabling engagement to take place with adults with opposing ideas and opinions and I, I had a conversation with her one day about, you know, so, so what is this? You know, I'd done some training with her. She was a mentor of mine. I was going, but what's that? What's this thing here? And she talked about a few things that she had gone and studied and coaching was one of those things. And it was something that I just hadn't heard of from a coaching perspective, obviously from a sports coaching perspective, but not from what we would might term as life coaching or transformational coaching, or performance coaching. And so I just started reading about it. I think my first book was Coaching for Dummies. Uh, I just kind of started going, what is, what is this thing? And I just found it interesting. Um, and so I went and I did a course. But that my first course I did was very much around the GROW model. And so I was that person with a hammer. So everything was a nail. And I, I had my model and I was squeezing everything into the model. And I was going, there must be more, right? There must be something else to this and at the same time I was still continuing doing my my drama workshops and building coaching I guess into that work and then getting invited by teachers to do this other thing that was happening in these drama workshops with their young people especially their challenging young people 
which I don't see as challenging. I see as the ones that have the energy, the excitement, the fire, the passion, but we haven't directed it or harnessed it yet. Um, and so I kind of fell into coaching young people because it wasn't my idea. It was just to get better at running my workshops. And then through that kind of being on the coaching circuit as a new coach, because you join every group you can find that coaches are part of because you, you're trying to find your way and understand what this all is. Um, there was a group called London Coaches and it was a, a meetup group that I found and the, uh, the, the, the organizer of that group was Nick Bolton, who's the founder of Animus. And um, he was having a conversation, he says. He says he was in dialogue. It sounded like he was telling them off, but he was basically saying, hey, you uh, say you want events, events are created, and then you don't turn up to events. What's that about? As coaches, what's, what does that mean? If as coaches, we say we want something and we don't follow through on that, what does that mean for us as coaches who work with our clients and kind of having this really interesting philosophical debate with them? And I just found it hilarious that this guy was telling people off uh, because they hadn't turned up to it. They said they wanted something, but they didn't really want it. And so I just kind of messaged him and said, I find this hilarious. And then we got into this conversation where he talked about it being a dialogue and me thinking he was telling them off. And he sort of said, what do you do? And I said, you know, I work in schools, I do drama workshops, I do coaching. And he was like, oh, okay. So, you know, I run a coaching school and we're looking at working with uh, people who want to work with young people. And we have some programs that we're doing that's looking at coaching young people. Would you be interested in being involved? And then maybe a year, year and a half later, we actually started working together. And part of that working together, I attended the, uh, the Diploma in Transformational Coaching. And that's where I think I really understood what coaching was about. Because to start with, I was, I had a sense of it. Um, and I had my grow model and a few other tools that I'd picked up along the way, because I, was, I remember going, there has to be more to this. And I think when I found Animus, I found the more that I was looking for and understood the depth of where coaching could go and what coaching could do. And also understood the, the language. I think there's a real uh, parallel for me around my training as an actor as well, because a lot of my training as an actor was more naming what I was instinctively doing and understanding where that instinct came from. And I think that was pretty much the same for my coaching that I understood where this instinct came from um, and what I was trying to do in that coaching space and was able to, to kind of, uh, understand it and therefore explore it so by getting clear about what I was doing intuitively I could then go and research that intuition and build a deeper knowledge base behind it that's a really long answer to your question you know Robert I was just thinking that but I was thinking it in a terms of wow there's so much in this there's so many places we could jump and it's a really beautiful answer with so much texture in it maybe to start, what I'd like, what I'd love it if you could do is give us a, give me a sense of the time. So when, when was that first, like, w when are you coming to coaching? When was that first Whoa. workshop about Grow Model? And when was the Animas training and yeah. the facilitation, yeah. if you don't mind? Yeah. So I'm, I'm laughing because, uh, as, as my partner will, will tell everybody, is once it's happened, it's happened. And I often say to people, oh, yeah, you know, I did that you know, four or five years ago, and my partner would go, well, you couldn't have done that four or five years ago, because you did this four or five years ago, and that four or five years ago. So I reckon I came into coaching about 15 years ago. Mm. I reckon that must be the sort of timeline of it. Um, and then I would say then 12 years into that would be the kind of meeting uh, Nick and becoming involved in, in Animus. And that animus journey was a was a you know I was going to say was an interesting journey is an interesting journey and its start point was really interesting because there was no desire on that journey to be where I am right now but where I am right now is the obvious place for me to be <laughs> so I'm a big yeah you know, so I guess um I, I'm aware that I'm not answering your question again or not succinctly but anyway I'll, I'll <laughs> 
I, I, I'm aware that I, uh, coming from a drama background and from an improvisation space is that idea of saying yes to things, saying yes and, and building on things. So when somebody says, do you want to do this? Go, yeah, I'll do that. And, and what are we going to do with this? And what's next? And, and, and learning how to do it. And sometimes those things are really successful and sometimes they're not. So my career has been a series of accepting opportunities and seeing where they take me. Mm. Look, I want to, um, I, I, I probably want to come back in a bit. I want to talk a bit more mm. about Grow, a bit more about yeah. Animus and your experience there. And obviously we want to get into the story and how that's gone since then. But, you know, you've kind of brought it in twice. And I think it's such a, these questions about performance and about mm. um, your background as an actor and a performer, it's, it's so interesting in the way that you talked about it. And part of the reason that I'm interested in that is, it's not that public, but I, I did like it was acting was really my hobby, my only hobby or my only passion between the age of about 11 and 25 mm -hmm. or 26. Um, and that included dabbling and, and we could talk about the kind of sliding doors, perhaps moments in applications <laughs> to drama schools about getting into just the wrong number of places and not getting into just the wrong number of places that it felt like the wrong mm. thing for me to do. And in some ways it probably was, but that all that experience, like I, I really I can really feel all that experience and practice in all kinds of ways and everything from improvisation to um, to um, something I've heard you say before about, you know, the questions we ask our clients are quite similar to the questions we ask about our characters when yeah. we're performing. And yeah. for me, it, it's it's like this one of the type I kind of when I was acting, one of the things when I felt like I went to a new level was when I realized that what I was trying to do was connect the dots that I had from the script or the structure of the device piece yeah. into something coherent that I could then be in the yeah. moment and that's really what a lot of the time that when I'm doing great coaching that's what I'm doing you know not yeah. always but like it's there so is the uh, the practice of presence yeah um and 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 I love and and you know we could we could probably talk for hours about improv and there's that great book <laughs> there, about improv wisdom bringing it to the world and I guess yeah maybe just you could just bounce off that or or you could tell us like how has that that practice that you had and yours is even more physical it sounds like and it was more professional and more successful than mine um, <laughs> and more in depth like um how has how has and does that inform how you work so i i i don't remember the point it wasn't when i first started coaching it, it was or when i first learned about coaching but there was a point down the road where I went wait a minute this this so what do you want to achieve what, what do you want to get from this what's your end goal is like a super objective of a play and I and, and I don't remember the moment there was a moment where I suddenly went wait if you think about this like a, a piece of theater or a story and you are the character in this story devising the, the, the story or deciding to recreate the story, it opened up a whole load of questions and thinking for me that I didn't have when I first started. So when I first started and it was the grow model, and I was like, so what do you want to, what do you want to get? Let's make that smart. You know, what's the reality of this? What have you done? What haven't you done? What are the things you could do? What might you do? It was like, that was very kind of chink, 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 chink uh, for me. But there was something about, about going, but who are you? Who are you being? Um, what is this story that you are living in? And what's the story that you want to be living in? And therefore, what needs to emerge from you as this character that will enable that story to unfold? What are the parts of the story that you are missing, that you are not engaged with, that you need to engage with in order to create that story and that outcome for yourself. And I had no idea there was this thing called narrative therapy and narrative coaching when I started to think about those things. And I remember I did a talk once about um, uh, towards a positive narrative, I think the title of it was, and it was this idea that we can create the stories for ourselves. And as, as coach and coachee, that's what we're doing. We're going, what's the story that we want to create? And the story might be overcoming something. It might be achieving something. And when we think about bringing our best self 
to that thing or our ideal self to that we're kind of going what are the characteristics in me that I need to bring forward to achieve that thing and at some point during the journey I just went oh my gosh this this coaching and storytelling <laughs> that they, they feel like they're the same thing and then years later I did some work with David Drake around narrative coaching and I was just like yeah this is who I am this is who I am and how as I show up as a coach uh, and I was able to define it and that definition is uh, only for a moment because how I coach has shifted and, and, and is constantly changing and being impacted upon by the world around me but I do recognize that I'm very focused on so who are you in this story and who do you want to be or who are you not being in this current story that you that we call life or we call the challenge or we call whatever uh that's stopping you uh from achieving it and and also within that for me is the hero's journey and like you know i'm a great lover of the matrix um and other such movies that have that hero's journey within them and like you know when i came across joseph campbell's work I was like, okay. And I think it was because of Star Wars that I came across his work. I think I watched a documentary about the making of Star Wars and, they, and there's Joseph Campbell talking about the hero's journey and how that relates to Luke Skywalker. And then you go, wait a minute, that's why these, these movies touch us so deeply because we are all on our own hero's journey. I say all, and I know the coaches listening will go, oh, look at that language that Robin is using but I, I do actually feel that we're all on a hero's journey and we're on some stage of that journey and um, part of our narrative or our story of life is recognizing the journey that we are on um, and deciding whether we want to go for it or not deciding whether we want to to go along that path because some of us choose not to, and that's kind of okay. It's okay as long as it's a choice. I think for me, it's when it's not a choice. I think that's when the damage happens, or that's when I say damage, that's where the unhappiness comes from. It's when we don't make the choice, we're not aware of the choice. Um, yeah. Yeah, and again, real richness in that. And yeah, I really encourage people who haven't uh, come across the hero's journey. I think it's, a, it's incredibly interesting concepts um, mm. and i i agree like it feels like um that i think that we are all on it i think that that's or it, you know or it is a way through which we could describe the journey that we are all yeah. on something yeah. maybe i yeah. don't know if that's i don't know actually what distinction i've just made but it, either way it's like there is something really powerful about that and to just remember you know it's like uh, you know to remember that probably there's a whole series of of heroes journeys that will go on in our life and there might be one overarching one and if people haven't looked it up it you know essentially you could you probably know more about it than me but essentially joseph campbell's idea was that uh, underneath a lot of these very powerful stories that have been repeated down the generations and i think across cultures there's yeah, this yeah. single structure that often shows yeah. up and it you know it's the structure of star wars and and right he was a consultant on that or something yeah. like that right yeah it's the story of it's probably the story of rocky isn't it it's like definitely the story of spider-man's origin story i think it's the story of pretty much every pixar film you know it's like <laughs> it's, it's in there and 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 it's definitely the hobbit and the lord of the rings are the same you know um but yeah and he you know he talks about it as the the mono myth the myth that sits with all the myths and you know that just in thinking about that it makes me think about you know how as as we talk about it as cultures but it's like where did that come from originally that created this or what is it about the human mind that is drawn to this story or drawn to this way of thinking and as you said it's just the lens through which we can view our experiences um and and it's also you know with with that hero's journey is that the quest and i love the idea of you know you know, we're going to go on a quest and, and who's going to come on that quest with us and who are we going to meet along the way and who are we going to leave behind on the way and you know how you know in the especially in the hobbit where they talk about and lord of the rings where you know they leave one place they leave the shire to go on this quest and they are changed through the quest so when they come back that place where they started isn't the same and i think this is what happens to coaches is we go on a quest of knowledge when we learn about coaching and so our world our family our friends our surroundings is, is is one place and we go on this knowledge journey 
And when we finish our training or our initial training and we come back to our world or even during that training, we come back to our world and our world isn't the same anymore because we've learned new language, we've learned new understanding, we've learned new prisms through which to see uh, our experiences, but the world that we left hasn't learned that. And there's something really interesting about how coaches go on mini quests when they learn about coaching and how that can really be a disruptor for their lives. It can be an enhancer and a disruptor. Uh, It's definitely a change maker and how we as coaches wrestle with those with those changes and uh, come to terms with or not uh, with our changed self through that journey. Yeah, I'm remembering um, after the first weekend of the coaching training that I did coming home, uh, not to this flat, to our old flat, I think, and having a massive row with with my now wife, then girlfriend, Emma. And, you know, it was exactly that. It was like something has happened to me. I am on or have just been through um, a transformation of some kind and whoa, the world hasn't like caught up and how do I deal with that? And and it's absolutely Mm. there. And it's probably, you know, the other thing that was going through my mind as you were speaking is it's also what happens for our clients in every, after every session, right? Mm. They go back to the world and they've spent the last 40 minutes, hour, hour and a half, however, however long changing. And, you know, especially if you're playing in the way that you are, where changing potentially the story that about their life about who they are and then they have to step back out into the world and that can sometimes be a you know have that shock value too but it's probably worth saying that like um and i think this is really important and true because that can sound it can sound uncomfortable and it can be like therefore i shouldn't go back right but the whole point of the journey (laughs) is that you have to go back to the real world you know you have to go back to the shire and you have to change you know have to be different in the shire and until you've done that the 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 journey of growth isn't over yeah because because it's really easy just to keep moving places um and and leaving groups but it's how do you allow the change self to be part of that group Uh, but also how do you go through the difficulty of this i know that for me i became like a lot of coaches evangelistic about coaching and I, I remember somebody saying to me, you're a bit weird these days. <laughs> you know, you, I'm not, we're not quite sure what's happened to you. And um, I mean, again, well, I'm just being positive and rah, I'm being so kind of adamant that I had found the light, as it were. And it took me a couple of years to go, do you know what? These people are my clients. They haven't signed up to do this work with me. They're just hanging out with me. And so I'm just going to hang out. And they haven't signed on to my newsletter. So me pumping this stuff out on to them through my, uh, whether that's, you know, Facebook or whatever that, that medium is to these people that are just hanging out is that they haven't signed up to this, which really makes me think about, you know, there is a kind of a, contracting piece with the world that we need to remember as coaches is that we haven't contracted the world we've contracted our clients and so we can be in that space with them showing up like that and it doesn't mean we shouldn't show up like that to the world but it means that we have to recognize that that the world is still doing what it does and so we have to find how to, how do we get these two speeds to to meet and to coexist and to recognize, you know, nowadays I'm in conversations and I hear stuff and I'm just like, yeah, I've heard that. I'm, I'm, I heard that. I heard that. I don't need to question everything that somebody says. But when I first started coaching, it was a bit of what I did, which caused the disruption in relationships. Um, that, yeah, that I just think it's a very interesting thing. And I think we, I think it's useful to go through because I think there's growth in that and there's, there's a self-awareness that one gets to. And I also think when we go through that, we do leave some people behind. I used to talk about this idea of when, when we learn coaching, it's, it's like we shift our orbit and therefore all the other planets that are around us shift their orbit too. And some of them shift their orbit to compensate and adjust and be in alignment with us and others will spin out into other solar systems and that's just part of the growth and not to 
be concerned about that because sometimes people spin. So I've had people that have spin out, spin out, spun out of my orbit and in time come back again as they've changed or if I've changed again and again and again. So it's like not to be too precious about that, but just recognize that we're changing and therefore the world around us will change. And for our clients, they're changing, therefore the world around them will change. And one of the things I remember Nash Popovich saying in, in a talk that he did was, this is one of the reasons why it's good to have a series of sessions with somebody. So we can go on that change journey with them as opposed to they work with us and then they go off and do it on their own. It's like we are uh, walking alongside them as they go through these challenges and they try to work out what these differences mean. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, again, uh, like I really recognize that thing about the, the relationships we have and, and being weird uh, when you first learn, learn about it as well. And I think, you know, it's really useful just to hear you say that because it'll, you know, for people especially, and it must be great for the, the students at Animus to hear things like that because it's just like prepare them so that they, when they get out into the world, it's not so much of a shock that those, those kind of things happen. And, and I really remember, um, just to catch as well, that, that really interesting thing about the series of sessions, I remember kind of realizing that what I was doing, like quite early on, I, the way I was structuring my engagements wasn't, I, don't, I think that what was happening, I've, I've not, never seen it quite like this before, I realized I needed to do a little bit longer with clients. And I think that probably what was happening is that last bit, we weren't, we, you know, because of the way I am or the way they were, that last bit, we didn't quite, you know, get the bit where we really helped them integrate it. Um, mm and you know return to the return to the shire um you know or, or, or whatever that is it, just want to catch on the hero's journey it, it also sounds like because there's that great bit in the hero's journey about refusing the call right yeah <laughs> and yeah. i don't know if you see it like this but i had a, a not totally dissimilar thing where i uh, to your thing about going learning grow and it's like that that's kind of it but it's not quite it and then mm. you and then then you found the thing that was really it and uh, yeah i don't know whether that <laughs> I definitely had a thing where I kind of came to coaching, thought this isn't quite it, kind of went away and then came back. And then that was when it was the, it was the, the time to step over the threshold or whatever. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, they're, they're, <laughs> if we, we hold on to uh, the hero's journey, there's the guardians of the gates and the guardians are going, do, do you want this? Do you really want this? Let's test you. Let's push you back. Let's make this difficult. Let's see if you're going to dig deep. And, and do this. Uh, so sometimes when we come across things, we, we go, no, nah, this isn't for me. And it might be that it's not for us, or it might be that it's not the right time. Because there is also that kind of, you know, that, that the idea that there is a time for things. And it might not be a time as in a linear time frame, but it might be a knowledge time construct. Um, what do we need to know in order for this to be the right time to do something? Um, so I, I think that, that that's really interesting as well about uh, you, we can come across something and refuse it because we don't have enough information to really lean into it or enough understanding of what this thing is to fully understand it and appreciate it and uh, explore it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and so just thinking, you know, it's, I, I guess it's just thinking, going back to that, 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 kind of time where you learn the grow model and it's mm. really interesting i've you know i think <laughs> so the training that i did they the, it was a startup coaching um coaching school which has is resting now but it was i thought it was really interesting i'd i'd worked at a leadership development company um in arts and culture actually um and we did some coach training for some of those leaders in arts and culture and um as part of that and so i'd seen the grow model there mm. and it was really interesting that it wasn't in the coach training that i did and that must have been a decision by phil who founded that training and, and created it not to put it in and i think there's a really good reason for that which is that it kind of became uh, or it seems like sometimes it becomes the, right the hammer that we the only mm. hammer we have and people, I think coaches become a kind of victim of that model. So they're, they think they have to use it everywhere. It sounds like you got some, you managed though, using that, learning that, inspired by um, Matilda to, to, to use that in your work and learn from it, even though, even before you came to something more whole when you came across Nick and Animus. Is that right? Mm. Yeah, and I think that's you know, this is this is why I, I find life so interesting because I would 
say that the reason that I was able to do that was because of improvisation. Because it's like when you improv, you have a structure and then you play in and around that structure. So I was like, I've got this thing that I'm supposed to use, but I'm not always going to use it. And I'm going to come back to it. I'm going to bounce and go somewhere else and then see where we land and then come back to it. Um, and because of that, I was, I guess I was never afraid of what might happen because you know when you do improv that something's going to happen and so I knew when I sat with this person or with this group that something's going to happen and then our job is to pull from what's happened to go so what do we do with this next or how do we use what's happened to inform what we would like to happen yeah and it's so interesting isn't it because I think those parallels are so beautiful I mean Maybe it's true of all artistic practice, but but I think that the the, the one that it sounds like so it's certainly the one that I know best, and, and it sounds like the one that you know best is is that kind of that kind of uh, theatre related one, you know. But it but it is something, isn't it? Because it's like in improv, even in even in a, a scripted performance, you know, that if you watch a scripted performance and someone gets their line wrong, then the person responding has a choice, right? Do mm. they like so? And the, the the analogy would be the person getting the line wrong is the client saying something that is not <laughs> O while you're in O of grow, right? Yeah, yeah. And you get a choice at that point. Do you make them go back and do the O, which is what? And when you watch kids doing plays, like sometimes, or you know, or inexperienced people, that's what they'll do. And yet, yeah. in in the improv, and it's the, in improv, it would be the same as like I've got this joke that I want to tell, and no what no matter what you say, Robert, in our improv, I'm going to tell the joke. <laughs> And it might be funny, but the, everyone in the room can feel that the field of whatever's happening has yeah. been disrupted by that. Mm. And I think there is such a, um, you know, there are so many beautiful parallels about the, that, that, those practices and coaching. And I, I suspect that, um, like, my story is actually quite similar. It's like the, all that experience of trying to do that me means that when you get there, you kind of get, have the feel. Of, or yeah. I later came to realize that what I was looking for in my coaching sessions was a feeling of flow similar to what I had felt in in performance. I mean, I don't I just I'm, I'm curious if you've do you think there are lots of, like <laughs> I'm trying to think actually I have so I've got a small community of coaches that that, that I work with um, and two of them actually I was just, so the question I was going to ask is are there lots of people like us who have um, taken that experience of, of performance in that way and brought it into their coaching and I'm suddenly aware that there are two of a community of 10 I think at least two who ha do have some background in performance do you, have you seen that well, more? I, I, I so one of the things that I've noticed this year in the podcast and interviews that, that I've done or that, that we've done at, at Animus is people talking about improvisation learning improvisation doing classes uh, I know that uh, years ago when I did some work, uh, I attended some training from uh, David Shepard's NLP school, um, that one of the things that they talked about was improv training and part one of their trainings was to go and do improv work and, and to, to bring that to what you did. Um, what was I saying there? Oh yeah, so what, uh, what I've noticed, oh no, Hold on. What I think is that lots of people have arts based practices. Don't necessarily call themselves artists, but there is something about art and creativity that lends itself to coaching. Um, and whether that's, you know, and, and I'm talking art from whether it's somebody who cooks and makes up recipes, whether it's somebody who paints, draws, takes photographs, somebody that goes to plays and enjoys that experience is that there's an artistry that sits with them that flows into the coaching in in some way which you know on some level you could argue that coach is coaching is an art form and we're pulling on different art forms to inform our coaching yeah and i think you know what you've just said is beautiful and i think that 
It's a really important thing for all of us to remember. Like it was a great moment for me when I realized that all that practice <laughs> over whatever, what did I just say, like 15 years hadn't been wasted. Because when you leave mm. behind a part of your life, there's a kind of grief and loss about it. And, the, you know, the, one of the questions I was asking is, oh, is that, and a lot of people when they're changing career are thinking like, oh, was that a waste of time? That all that stuff that I've done before. And the answer is almost always no. Um, yeah. And, but particularly with those kinds of practices, it, it's really clear that they, give a you know any creative practice really gives a gives a, a great um foundation on mm. which to to build coaching and and anything we we have done gives us information to build on the next thing that we do uh often you know i, I don't train uh, at animus uh, anymore but when i was part of the training team uh, and we were doing our foundations uh, module, I'd be saying to people, don't throw away what you've learned because you're embarking on this new career. Don't throw it away. You don't need to burn the bridge. Uh, hold on to it because you don't know how it's going to inform or how it's going to be useful. So just kind of keep an eye on, on that past self to see how it might inform the next self. Yeah. And I mean, maybe now's the time, Robert, just to check in, like on what happened next. So in your journey, so as as those stages kind of went past, so you came across the Grow model and learned, mm. then you found Animus and yeah. trained there, and that felt like it changed something for you. You've mentioned doing some NLP training as well. What happened with your with your work and your coaching um, next, or 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 after that, or at that stage? Yeah. So so part of the 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 sort of the work at Animus was to create a, uh, a a training, a coach training for adults that wanted to work with young people. And I had worked with young people all of my career up to that point. That's kind of what I did from, you know, working with uh, reception kids around storytelling uh, up to sixth formers and university students about next steps. But, you know, that young people was my thing. Um, and... So we, so Nick and I created this program of training that said, you know, now that you've learned coaching, here's how you apply it and work with young people within. These are the things you need to look out for and understand and, and its relationship to mentoring. And so I became a trainer of coaches who wanted to work with young people. And I, so that was the kind of my next step was this training piece. Now I'd already been training and delivering workshops as part of the, the theatre stuff and drama stuff that I did. So, and also, um, you know, uh, having done improv shows or shows that were very close to improv. So, you know, I, my, my two best friends, Steve and uh, Isaac, we had our own theatre company together and we were, you know, three physical theatre, my artist guys touring and we would create these shows that had sections to them a bit like you know a grow model or another model that one might use that you know we move from this section to this section to this section and how we get there is kind of known but there's room for other things to happen in in that that journey um so i was very comfortable in front of people working with people training people on this stuff and what started to happen was i started I'd already started doing less theatre and more and more workshops. And then I started doing less drama-based workshops and more and more of this coaching-based work. And what do you think was happening? Why was that tra that transition happening? Um... I, I think partly uh, saying yes to things um, and partly that curiosity uh, going, this, this feels interesting. This feels interesting and exciting and new and different and um, and familiar. So there's something about it is like this doesn't feel scary. There's a familiar familiarity about it that allows me to do it and to learn about it as I'm doing it. Um, and so yes, yeah, so we had our youth uh, our youth coaching uh, CPD our certificate uh, that we did. Um, and I would do that three, four times a year. And then um, uh, I was, I, Nick was doing group coaching as well as a, a two day program. And he was looking for a, a trainer to take it over from him. And I was like, I, I can do that. Or, or rather I said, I think I can do that. 
<laughs> I was like, I know this bit. So I know all the very practical stuff around groups or some of the theory stuff. I was like, I don't really know this theory stuff. And he's like, read this, read that, read this, get your head around it, get in the room, go do it. Uh, and um, a little bit like uh, Matilda, um, a little bit like uh, Celia, Celia Greenwood, who was a, a drama teacher of mine when I was back at the Weekend Arts College. Um, the, 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 you know, these are they're pivotal people that go, go do it. Mm. Don't, let's not talk about it. Go, go do it. Go make it happen. Come back when you've done it kind of thing. <laughs> and, and, and so I then started doing youth coaching training and group coaching training um, and started to get really in the, I like this, lots of people working space. And it also felt like when I was doing theatre education training, which I'd done at various universities, I was like, I like this working with people. And also it was, I can have an impact here. So when I did my one, to, you know, I love one-to-one -one coaching. And one of the things I recognize is I have an impact on that individual and it has an impact on their world. But when I teach a group of people, I have an impact on that group and the impact is exponential. And there was something incredibly exciting about that. Um, and exciting in a, in a non-egoic way. So it's not like, oh, I, I get to change these people's lives, but more as a, I get to show you something that might be really interesting and really exciting. And I get to share it with you in a way that is interesting and exciting and engaging. Um, and I am passionate about it. So this, so part of that sort of sits with my education. So, you know, I, I, I kind of tumbled through school thinking it was just a place to hang out with your mates. Uh, and I wasn't really excited about anything and then got excited about drama. And then when I found physical theatre in mime, I was just like, whoa, I was blown away by how you could create illusions in space using the body. And I was just like so passionate about it that I decided to teach it. And it's something about when you're passionate and excited about something, you want to share it to others. And with coaching also came that humility of I'm going to share this with you and it's your choice what you do with this. I'm just going to share it. I'm just going to be a conduit for this information or this knowledge. Um, I'm not sure where I was going with that. <laughs> well, it's great. No, there's so much in there. It's like, well, I, I was asking like, what ha you, I was inviting you to join the dots really after yeah. that initial thing. Yeah. And, and, and there's so much in there. I think no one listening uh, or watching wouldn't hear or feel the, the passion that you have for sharing yeah. with groups. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's right there. And I think it's a really, the, the, one of the weird questions that crossed my mind, um, which is a bit of an aside, and then let's come back to this, is, you know, you've that that idea that we're impacting many people um, mm -hmm. and the groups, and then we're on now, right, on a medium, podcasting, and yeah. it's really interesting. So I listened to a few episodes of your podcast. Like, I really encourage any listeners who are interested to check it out. I think, um, you know, there's also, it, you know, in particular, as I was looking through the episodes, obviously I, did, I haven't listened to all of them, but I was, I was, there's, there's some, it's, it's a really beautiful resource for coaches who have all those, particularly who have all those questions, like what is group coaching? And it's great because there's an episode where you're talking <laughs> to someone about that and they can learn about it and they can get that first little, little thing. And, you know, so what you didn't know until I'm telling you now is that that work that you, and I listened to the conversation with you and, and David Drake, for example, which is so interesting. And I was aware of him and of narrative coaching, but I, I, I hadn't, uh, that's probably the, the most I've, that's, I now know more about it than I did before. Mm. And so that work that you did is having that ripple, right? And who knows where that ripple goes. But do you feel the same excitement about making something like this or like your podcast as you do when you're in a room and you can kind of feel the people? Uh, it's, it's a different excitement. Right. It's, 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 so when you're uh, in a, in a room with people, you can see it happening and you can feel it happening in that moment. When you do a, a podcast, the ripples are felt afterwards. So, you know, whether it's somebody dropping you a message about something you said that had a particular impact or created some thoughts or a shift for them or whether it's a, a, a guest that you have on that allows somebody to go, oh, that's what I want to do next, or that's what I'm thinking about. Um, or or, or uh, that's now I understand the work that I do because I've 
that that expert has, has shared that information with me so it's a it's a different thing but I do, you know, I do so enjoy the conversations because I get to talk about coaching. Yeah. I get to talk about the thing that I, that I, that I absolutely uh, adore. And I get to talk to people who also adore that thing. It's one of the, the thoughts that I had about coaches, you know, you know, finding your tribes. And one of the, you know, when I was talking earlier about how we um, become strange or weird when we first learn coaching, one of the things that Animus does really well and I know I'm completely biased is that we go but here's your space to do all of it to have those conversations here's your tribe so you can do that here because this this group of people will understand that so when you get your first paying client your friends that work at the office may may go yeah but you get your wage every week or every month so what, what is this first paying client why is that so important to you but those that have gone through that journey of doing that pro bono and that practice work and then shifting into that paid client work will understand that excitement. Or when, you know, you're, uh, uh, you do a book or a podcast or you do your first group workshop or your first retreat, not that we're doing retreats right now, but <laughs> when you do that thing that your tribe will understand and they will support you and they will also help you through the challenges of that. And I think that's a, a hugely uh, important thing. And, um, yeah, so 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 I, it's a different excitement, um, but I still get to do the thing that I love, which is talk about this stuff yeah. and 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 how coaching relates to other things and these dots that we can draw and 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 the power of it and the and the beauty of it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and I get so tell tell me a little bit about. So the, the it, it's ob- I think it's really interesting, you know, your, your your journey has been so tightly wound with animus because it was kind of it was your training and then you were very it sounds like pretty quickly you had that area of expertise that Nick Bolton was looking for and, and yeah. moved into that. Well, Tell, I, uh, I guess just quick, sorry, say whatever you want to say. Of course, always feel free to ignore my questions. But one of the <laughs> things I was wondering about is you've talked quite a bit about Nick and I don't know Nick personally, although I know a little bit about him and I wondered if you could speak a little bit to him and to that organization. Um, because I know, I, the one thing I do wanna say actually, is that thing that you just said about the communities, like I know from people I know who have trained at Animus, that that's true. So if just like, it's mm. like to just to reiterate what you said that, that you know, I've heard people talk about that many of the, of the aspects of that community that you just talked about, but. Yeah, yeah. so, so t- t- you know, to talk a bit to Nick is, you know, N- Nick is a, a, an entrepreneur, he's a visionary, he's, um, an existential thinker philosopher uh, and he created a, a coaching school that sort of resonates those things and I met him when that school was pretty uh, new and he was still doing all of the, the things all of the parts to enable that to to happen and um we've kind of intertwined on that on on that journey in in a way that's really interesting in a way that I couldn't predict so when I first met him we had a conversation and it was like six months later we had another conversation and then six months later we had another conversation but because I was a freelancer I was used to you have these conversations and sometimes things happen and sometimes they don't and sometimes they happen 10 years down the line or or whatever that might be so I wasn't in a rush and it wasn't part of my plan so I didn't have an agenda to to become a coaching trainer that wasn't part of it um i remember when i did my first coaching training saying to the the guy oh, i'd love to do a bit of this um when they were doing their introduction day and he was a bit dismissive <laughs> if i'm <laughs> honest they were a bit kind of well you know get, you're a newbie learn the skills and then maybe maybe we can think about it and i was like oh but i've got all of these other skills that they're not recognizing that would play a part to this but that you know that's that's another story um and 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 one of the things that is um that the people that know nick and have worked with nick will know or or, or recognize is that he will sometimes see something in you and push it he he can be quite provocative so he'll go why don't you try this why don't you do that here's here's this go make it happen and so he will push you. He will notice what you're good at before you sometimes notice it yourself. And so sometimes we have that resistance to trying it because we haven't recognized ourselves yet that we are good at this thing. And it gives 
he gives you opportunity, but he's also a, a, not necessarily a task master, but he also is quite clear about what he wants. And so when that's not happening, like, a, like I guess all entrepreneurs, they're like, but this is what I want to happen. So go make it happen. So it, he's also you know, tough in that challenge and in that support. And, um, you know, I, I started doing youth, then started doing group, and then started doing bits of the main diploma, started training on that. And I don't think it was either of our plans for me to be doing that. It was just kind of people felt, you know, people went off and did different things or they fell off the radar and I kind of took over or did a bit here. And over time, I became uh, one of the trainers at Adamus, but I was still a freelancer. And then we had the conversation about, well, do we, do we make this a part-time relationship? Well, I, was, I was resistant to that because I was like, but I've got all these other things that I do. I don't want to, you know, move. I don't want to lose those things because as a freelancer, you know that you want to keep lots of things on the go because you never know what's going to disappear. And if you put all of your eggs in one basket, what does that then mean? Um, and Nick was just kind of like, well, I, I think this would be good. You know, this, this would be the position that you would be in. You'd be the lead trainer. Um, and, uh, you know, it, and, and also he was at that point building the team around him. And so it's like, you know, an opportunity to be part of this team. And, you know, I've always been a lover of teams and tribes and communities. So I was like, yeah, I want to be part of this team. I want to join this and, and go on this journey. Um, and also my desire to say yes to things. So I was like, oh, if this sounds difficult, it could be scary, but I'm going to do it. So I did it. And then we did that for a little while. And he was like, well, actually, you know, you disappear half the week. Why don't you just be here the whole week? Let's just turn this into a full-time gig. Um, and that was a really hard one for me because I was at that, at that time, I was still part of my theatre company and we were still, we weren't doing theatre so much, but we were still running workshops and we still operated like a co-op. So all of a sudden it was like, it is the co-op over. And it was also uh, a pivotal moment for us as a, as, a, as a team, as Unclassified, because we were going, how we work has changed. The things that we are leaning into as artists has shifted. Is this just a part of that recognizing that this is the new way of working? And uh, I took I took the full time job, and um, we kind of shifted how we work. But what's beautiful, you know, them being my best friends is that we're still best friends to this very day. We still go on holiday together. We still, you know, every week one of us will be sending messages to the others in our group chat or or, or whatever. And um, so, so they, they, it was never difficult in that sense. It was just a, a shifting or a change. And, and then I was a full-time trainer for, for Animus. And um, that, that just kind of grew and shifted as the team grew and shifted. And, and as Nick said, you know, this is what our need is right now. Who's going to rise to meet that need? And over, you know, one of the things that I really know about Animus, it's, it's similar to that whole... Um, that the idea of uh, your, your comfort zone is that like Nick would stretch you to almost to breaking point. You go, oh my God, I can't, I can't do this. Oh, this is really difficult. And then he would kind of go, let's just shrink that down a bit so it's manageable. But then you go, oh, this is really manageable. And then something else would come along and you'd stretch. And it's just that you're constantly living that analogy of, of your stretching beyond what you think is capable. And then you edge back a bit and you go, oh, but your comfort zone has grown. And, and you just continue to grow and you continue to develop. And so over the years, I've just kind of shifted and moved through the company, but with never, never going, oh, I want to be this. It was always a, oh, this, this, here's another opportunity within the organization. How do we embrace that opportunity and, and see where that takes us? Mm. And just, I think I asked a similar question to this before and you gave a beautiful answer. I just want to ask it again though about this because it, including that moment of, of going from part-time to full-time, mm. like how did you, there's the sense of the, the, the possibility that you bring, which is like, yeah, I'll try these things and I'll mm. be stretched out of my comfort zone and mm. those kind of things. But how did you, that thing you said before, you know, I could never have planned this and yet it's, it's the right place that I've ended up or, or, or something mm. like that was what you said. In those moments of choice, how do you make those decisions about 
because 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 when you were saying yes to going part time or full time, you were saying no to things there, not mm. explicitly, but you were saying no. Actually, yeah. the theatre company's coming to an end in this format now. Yeah. So, do, do you like what's your sense of how you how you know? Uh, there's a beautiful coaching question. How do you know? <laughs> um, I, I guess that 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 the part of it is sensation. There is mm. a, a a sense to I want to try this. I want to give this a go. I want to see where this goes. There is also a, um, I, I don't know where I read this, but I read this or listened to this somewhere where somebody talked about ideas exist out there in the universe and they bounce around looking for a home. And when they land uh, on you, if you don't take it, it's going to go somewhere else. It's like poetry. Mm. Uh, it might be Liz Gilbert. I've heard Liz Gilbert say something similar to that. Could um, be, but, could be. Yeah, because because as I'm saying this, I remember, and it could be Liz Gilbert who said this. It, I'm not sure, but somebody saying they'd written a bestseller, and uh, people were saying, "So, what's your next book going to be like?" And she was like, "Well, it can only be less than this because this one was phenomenal in its creation." And and to went and spoke to different people who had, had done amazing writing and said, you know, what, what, how do you create the next thing? And somebody had said to her, you don't, it finds you. And this poet had talked about that poems come like a thunderstorm. And when the thunderstorm's coming, they grab a piece of paper and they capture the thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a thunderstorm passes through them and they missed it, but sometimes they grab it and they pull it back. <sighs> And, and they capture it. And when they read it, it's in reverse because they pulled it back into them. And, and there's something for me about these things are happening. And if you say no to this thing, and it's going to go somewhere else. So that's not it. it and, and sometimes that's okay. I mean, it's always okay. But it's like, but you could have a go at this. You, you could try this. You could see if you're any good at this. So give, give this a go and lean into this and see where this, this takes you. So there is a so I guess there's a sensation to it, but there's also listening to your deeper desire as well, and going, you know, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like a promotion. I'd like to be doing more. I'd, I'd, I, yeah, I'd like to be in charge of something. Okay, I'm, or the leader of something. I'm going to give this a go, um, or, or, or I'd like to try something different. And here is something that's being offered to me. Let me let me take that. Let me go. You know, what you know you might hold on to this idea of universal timings for things and go right so if this is being offered to me let, let me take that but also recognizing there are things you go oh, that's been offered to me but I'm not going to go there and sometimes that's through fear or through a, a sense of but I'm, I'm enjoying where I am right now and I'm not ready for the for the change um and, and I think for me it's about does this does this sound like it's going to excite me does this sound like it's going to bring a, 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 a line with and a light passion within me? Hmm. And if it does, then I'm going to go for it. I remember I got a, got um, offered some work at uh, uh, Anglia Ruskin University and uh, doing some teaching on one of their, um, is it one of their postgrads, I think? And I was like, this is great. I get to go and talk to a group of, six people about what I love about theatre and education for three hours every week and they have to take what I'm talking about and apply it to their work I'm saying yes to that because this is amazing and I remember somebody saying but you know you you don't have this qualification or that qualification and you don't have this and you don't have that I was going yeah and you know, I'm going to rock up and I'm going to enjoy this and see where this takes me yeah. And, you know, where it's taken me over time to so the, the gentleman I worked with on that program was Chris Grady. And he uh, is the chair, uh, the, the, the chairman of the board for a theatre company. And last year I joined the board of that theatre company. Um, and so it's like these things kind of spiral out and then come back and then mm. spin around. And so... Yeah, it's, it's saying yes because it excites you. It feels passionate. It feels a bit scary. Yeah. Um, but doesn't fill you with so much fear. It's debilitating. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it sounds like, you know, I like the way you talk, you know, I love the, hearing about Nick as a leader. Like that feels like what you've just told, one of the things you've just told us about um, and that that idea that he might have invited you into the place where it's scary and then help you find the place where it's not and it's just the right the right place. Um, just like in some way, whatever way you want, bring us up to date with, with what it is that you do now and how that relationship <laughs> with Animas is what that's become because people, yeah. listeners, you know, they'll, I, you know I'll, I, I've explained a little bit about who you are, but you know, bring us yes. up to date with, with what, what that means now. And as part of that, I, it's really funny. I, um, I was on the, the Animus website this morning. And when I, when we first booked this in, which was a little while ago for, for, cause I was on fraternity leave and things. Um, I found when I was doing some research then I found an, an open letter from Nick about his retirement. And then when I was on the <laughs> website just now, he's still there right at the top. What's, what's, what's been going on? <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. Okay, so so yeah, so I guess I need to talk about that to talk to also explain where where I am. So uh, so my my current title because titles change at Animus, which is part of the beauty of being at Animus, is like yeah. you know nothing's going to stand still. We, we don't stand still as an organisation. Um, so I'm the centre director, and it took us a while to land on that title because uh, prior to that I was the director of of training. And uh, there was there was a team of us that were that sort of director roles within the organization. And Nick had got to a point in his life where he was like, uh, I've got married. I've bought a boat, uh, returned to that kind of canal life that, that a place that he'd come from before and was like, I, I'm going to go and, and do that for a while. And so I'm going to going to step back from Animus. I'm going to retire from Animus, but in a sense of. I'm still going to be here and in touch, but you guys go run the company. And um, I, at that point, I got promoted to CEO of the company. But we hadn't really understood at that moment what we were, what was really happening. Um, and um, and so Nick went away for a while and I would report to him on a monthly basis. We, you know, we had a few challenges within the organization, some shifts and turns like all organizations uh, have. And um, one day Nick and I were in a conversation and we went, Robert, you're not really the CEO and I haven't really retired. We, we, that hasn't really happened. It's what we thought we were doing, but in the, the reality is that's not what has happened. And, and also part of it was, I think our, just our, I don't know if, it, if you'd call it a lack of understanding or, or what, but you might say in retrospect, Nick needed a break or wanted a break and went and had a break and I acted up while he was on that break. And then when he came back from that break, I shifted it's down. But I don't know if I'd call it down or up. I would just call it, there was a shift. And, and it sounds like the thing that you've been doing all along, both you as a, as a person and also the company, which is like experimenting and feeling yeah. what was going on. It doesn't yeah. sound like you didn't know enough. It sounded like, it sounds, but then I, you know, I wasn't in there. It's like, it sounds like, well, here's where, what we think is, is happening now and let's do that and see what happens. Yeah. And, then, and then the beautiful humility, talked about humility before to go ah oh, <laughs> that's not actually what was happening that's not what wants to emerge right now in this company and not what we want to emerge in, in some way it sounds like and so what do we do with that now that it's happened and I remember there was this beautiful conversation we had when we were talking about the vision of the organization and, and where the organization goes next and kind of going hmm so you're you're still the visionary of this organization and this organization is your baby and I, you know, I remember when I was part of the theatre company and we had people come in and work for us. It was like, it's really hard to hand over your baby because it's your baby. So it's like, how do we do that? And then um, I remember kind of going, that's interesting because if you're doing this and I'm doing, and I'm responding to it in this way, then actually the titles that we have aren't the right titles. And they're just titles, right? They're just, they're just words that we use to give somebody outside of our space and understanding of where we sit within an organization. But then within the organization, sometimes you can be operating differently from the definition of that title. And um, I, I think we talked about theater as well, actually, which is, 
which is funny. I think we talked about this idea of um, it was like he was the the, the theatre owner and I was the the artistic director, mm. and um, and that that they, that actually what was happening was he was going. This is where I see us going, and I went. Okay, this is how I help the team get to where we see us going. And this is how I support the team. So now my role is working with Nick to go, this is the vision of where we're going to go. This is what we're going to do over the next five years, the next three years. Oh, right. So what are we going to do for the next year? And then I work with the leadership team to enable those things to happen for us to meet our, our vision and for us to meet our missions. Uh, we have four missions and I go, right, how are we going to meet these missions? How do we interact as a team to make that happen? What do we need to understand? Um, what are the resources that you need? What's the support that you need? And, you know, I get to both support my team. I get to coach my team. I get to push my team. Um, so that's that's kind of the role that I'm in now. And um, some of that means that there are things that I'm more in tune with because it's been part of my journey. So that I guess the, the training stuff, I kind of go, I, I understand that much quicker so when we're creating new training I can go oh let me look at that and I have a sense of what might need to happen with that whereas things like uh the the marketing process it's like we have uh Serona who's amazing at that stuff and I need somebody who's amazing because I kind of know that she kind of does this stuff but I need her to tell me what that means and how that works so she can go and do that and one of the shifts that we've had within Animus over the years is that uh nick and i and others we've brought people in that we've known and allowed them to mold into a role but as the company has grown we've gone actually we need to bring people in that understand this role already so that they can bring their expertise to this space as opposed to as opposed to having to learn about this space so there's been a shift in the organization and and as we grow it's like you have to become more structured. I talk about this idea that, you know, for a long time, we were just this corner shop, family corner shop, where everybody knew everybody and everybody did a bit of everything to run this corner shop. But now then we became a department store. And it's like, well, you can't do everything. And then as that department store opens up other sites, it's like, you absolutely can't do everything. So you have to create systems and processes. And part of my job is how do we do that and still keep the heart? yeah how do we balance this i love hearing the story partly because it feels like it's such a live one and and it's a really you know it's a story that in different ways is being repeated in different companies across and organizations across industries and um, what is that heart of animus like that thing that you're trying to preserve as it grows for people who don't know the organization or or haven't been through the training Hmm. what is it that for you makes makes it so special well, there's a few things in there. So part of it is is the community. It's this group of people that have a shared and challenged philosophy. So there are people in the community that, you know, will, will challenge our own thinking, but part of being in the community is to go, well, let's do that. Let's, let's, let's challenge what we think and question it, but have the humility to step back and go, oh, I thought that, and now I think something different. You know, a community that, that that walks the talk, that doesn't just go, you should change your life, but people are actually changing their own lives as part of that that, that community. Um, I think it's, you know, part of Animus is this, this idea about being courageous to live your life and, and being around people that have the courage to make change for themselves and, and their families um, and... Uh, that support each other in that and I, I would say that there's a lot of love in in what we do um and and how we are there's you know we 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 care deeply for our team and for our teammates um and are supportive of each other and sometimes that's difficult because sometimes you're balancing a business and somebody's own stuff for want of a, 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 a better word. Um, and you know, it's how, how do we do this and how do we navigate this? And 
let's have conversations to navigate that together to explore well what do we do next um and and because of that people come and people go and we have conversations with about that and I would say that most of the people that choose to move on still have a relationship. You know, some don't because some go off and do different things, and that's 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 how it is. Um, but I would say for most who knows where that ends, right? People, when the orbit comes back and absolutely, you know, kind of absolutely, because you, you just don't know uh, when they will return, as it were, or when we will catch up. Um, <laughs> so, so I think there's there's a lot of that in there, and I th I think. You know, as a you are changed through the training. So this isn't a training where you just rock up and you learn some stuff and then you apply that stuff to others. It's like you 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 learn and you grow through this. And so we're part of a community that is constantly growing and evolving and learning. And, and new people are coming into that and growing and learning and evolving. And people are finding a home here at, at, in the Animus community. I often hear people talk about, ah, oh, I found somewhere where I can land. Um, and so, so I think that's part of, of the heart, you know, the idea of here's a space where you can be authentically you with whatever that means for you. And in that authenticity, it, you may challenge or be challenged, but how do we do this in a way that is, that is, um, that leaves everybody feeling okay? Not as in everybody feels happy and clappy and goes, oh, that was wonderful, but goes, oh, okay, I recognize what's happening here. How do we be in, in you know, transactional terms? How do we stay adult in this? And even when it's full of emotion and angst and urgh, how do we share that and then step back from that and look at that and explore that? So, you know, one of the things I love about what we do is we have uh, what we call our town halls. We have a monthly town hall where everybody in the Animus community is invited to sit with myself and our community events manager, Kat, and talk about what's happening in Animus, what they're noticing, what they're feeling, what, what are we doing well, what could we do better? Where are the niggles? Where are the challenges? And we sit and we have a conversation. And in that conversation, I don't go, I'm going to fix all the things that you bring to me. I go, I'm here to listen and to understand and to, to notice what are we doing from an organizational perspective and what the ripple effects are of that into our communities. What might we change or what, what are people missing or or, or what is it that we're doing that we kind of go, oh, this is a great idea, let's do this. But it just, it's not landing or you're not hearing about it because we haven't communicated it correctly. So, you know, that's the other thing is that, that, that we stay open uh, with our ear to the ground with the community. Um, and, you know, because of that, we've, we've, we've made we've sort of, we've changed things and then we've gone that the community don't like that or that doesn't work for the community. So let's change it back. Um, and let's just go, yeah, got that wrong. Let's change that back. And then there are other times we go, no, we haven't got that wrong. That is how we're going to do it. And, and that's, that's how it is. Um, but here's the why that sits with it. Let's look under the bonnet of this. And I think that, you know, we, we run the organization from a coaching perspective so we try to be open and honest and transparent and share what we're doing and why we're doing that out into the space um and and you know one of the other things i love about it is that people do the course they they love it they go off they learn some stuff they come back they become trainers on the program or they create new courses that we then deliver as part of what we do and it's this kind of allowing people to find spaces to evolve into what they do. And, and, uh, and I find that, you know, incredibly exciting. Yeah. And what are you like, what are you excited about or interested in at the moment? What, what's the, what's the growing edge for you and for, for Animus? So it's really interesting. So um, one of the things that I'm really excited about is this whole diversity in coaching piece. I mean, there's there's a whole diversity and inclusion conversation that's happening in the world right now that I feel that the pandemic has pressure cookered 
and intensified and has meant that we can't not face it because it's in our faces and the distractions that are normally there aren't there. They don't mm-hmm. exist. So we have to see this. So um, for a long time, you know, I would uh, say to Nick, oh, look, we're at another conference and there's me and three other black people at this conference and three other Asian people and, and three other whatever nationality that there, there might be. But there's this idea that um, representation doesn't seem to be existing. And I'm like, what, what's that about? And, you know, <clears throat> as a trainer of coaches, recognizing that I'm in the coach room, there is this mixed group of people. But when I go into these other coaching spaces, these people aren't there. Why aren't they there? What's that about? Do they not feel comfortable? Do they not feel it's their right place? Are they not invited? Do they not feel represented? What's that about? And when sort of um, there was that, you know, that terrible incident in America where where somebody lost their life, um, uh, where a police officer kneeling on their neck and that kind of being filmed and around the world and people were making statements about what they did about it. We went, okay, we've talked about this stuff, but we've never done something about it. So let's do something about it. And part of that doing something about it is me going, right, I'm going to have conversations about this. I'm going to talk to people. I'm going to go, what's your diversity like? Or what do you think about diversity in coaching? I had a great conversation a couple of months ago um, about the term uh, BAME. And somebody's written an article about how much they disliked the term. And I was going, oh, I've just created a, co- a, a group called the BAME Coaches Network. And, and you're saying you dislike that term. Let's have a conversation about it. And help me to understand what it what it is in that term you know and they, and they talked about that they're clumping together as a group and the hierarchy within the, the term itself and what does this mean about the other and right. I was like I hadn't even thought about that okay let's think about this let's talk about this and um I remember looking at the uh, the cover of a coaching magazine and it had it was it's I'm going to make up a number here. Let's say it was 10th year anniversary and they showed all the covers over the last 10 years and there were no black people on any of the the images. And I was like, we're not challenging that as coaches and coaching organisations. We're not going, what does this say? And so for me, what's exciting is going, what does that say? What does that mean? Let's have a chat about that. With some 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 of these conversations are private conversations because you know for some people that they are not the voice of their organisation. So we have private conversations and we talk about what what we might do together to create change. And some of them are public conversations, and some of those are uh, you know like in our our article in Coaching Today, where we're going, this is what we're seeing, and and I kind of look around and I go there aren't there so I look around the UK and I go oh that's really interesting so there aren't many other black uh people in my position within organizations what's that about and because I'm a coach and I work in a coaching organization I feel that this is my edge this is the space where I can have this conversation because this is where I live as it were so I'm going okay what, what do we do in our town? How do we make our town different? Um, and then we can move to the next town, but let's start here and explore what that means for us and what we want to do about it and how we might do something about it. So that's, that's something that I'm deeply passionate about, you know, and, and, and some of that passion comes from a recognition of being in theater and knowing that you're not gonna get that part because of the your your skin color or your class or um, or your gender or whatever it might be, going it's not a you know there is something here where people get left out, um, and that's not I'm not going to say fair because it's not about fair. It's like well that's not right. It's like why are we leaving some people out the conversation? Why aren't they in the conversation? I had a, a lovely conversation with somebody recently uh, where they were going, so are you just doing diversity I was, you know, in terms of colour? I was like, no, 
but it's where I'm going to start because it's what I know. And I'm going to start where I know, and then I'm going to go into the places that I don't know and invite people to have those conversations with me as well and go, so what's your lived experience? And how do we bring that into our coaching spaces? Because we talk about coaching being this uh, open and shared and non-judgmental space, but it's like we've got this unconscious bias that exists that we haven't addressed. So how do we address that? How do we create conversations and dialogues to do that without creating shame and judgment and blame? Because the moment you start going, you should have this going on, mm -hmm. then people get defensive because they feel attacked. Well, and, and you know, sometimes we get defensive because we feel embarrassed that we haven't noticed that thing before. So it's how do we create, how do we create true dialogue? You know, how do we use the skills that we have as coaches to have dialogue about this and to lean into what's difficult? um uh, about this and to own our part in this and go but what do we do now i had a lovely conversation um with maria S S oh, her name her surname is a, is french canadian <laughs> and i'm reaching for it so i'm not going to go there no, well, well, um, I should say, we, we can, we'll, we'll find we'll find it and we'll put a link to her in the show notes sure. we'll do that with everything that we've mentioned for anyone listening as well and and, and she was talking about you know she is as a, a white lady was doing uh, some work and, and recognized that, you know, she was the minority in the group that she was doing that work with. And we just went, I'm gonna lean into this. And I'm gonna say, I recognize as we sit here that my ancestry may have some dubiousness about how it's supported or not supported uh, the, the rest of your ancestors in this space. I am not my ancestors. So I, I can apologize for what they, what they have done, but what I can do because I can't change what they did. What I can do is I can show up now and go, what do we do now? How do we make change now? How do we deal with this in our now? And I was like, that's brilliant, right? Because if we get caught up in, you did this back then, if that's our only story, you know, we need to go back, swing all the way around to narrative coaching. If that's our only story, that's going to be our next story. So how do we go? Well, that was our story. We're going to change that narrative and we're going to create something different um and and we are going to create something that we want to be in the space how do we do that and for me it's by having conversations with people we have a um a summit happening later this year which is uh, going to be about inclusion and our desire is to have as many different and differences as possible taking part in that talking about the spaces in which they work and what that means to to them to also give people the opportunity to go oh my gosh there are that many spaces so we can work in all of these spaces or we can go i can just be aware of those spaces we don't have to do something because what i'm not saying is you have to do something i'm saying here's an invitation um, how would you like to be involved in this? What would you, what part would you like to play that resonates and feels right for you uh, in that, as opposed to forcing you? Because there's been some, and I, I'm aware that I might be a bit ranty right That's now. That's great. That's great, Robert. <laughs> Please keep going. There's, there's, there's been conversations about um, uh, climate change and, you know, you've got the climate change, the coaching climate alliance. I think it is. And, and they've been talking about how, as coaches, do we bring the climate, the, the, the challenge with our climate to our coaching conversations and to the coaching space? I remember having a conversation saying, OK, how do we do that and allow it to be a client led space? Right. It's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. How, how, and, and, and somebody's saying in one of the conversations, yeah, but if we don't have this conversation and we don't make change, we're not going to survive. I was going, that may be the case, but I think if you start my, this is all my opinion. And my opinion is when I work with my clients, I don't want to hold the, my agenda in the space. I want to hold their agenda. But I also recognize that I can do something about climate change. And I can be vocal about what I want to do about climate change and people can come and work with me because they hear my vocalness in that. And, that, and that's, that's great. 
but there is this thing of how do we create invitations as opposed to demands hmm. and, and it's one of the things that i felt when uh the pandemic started was there was some coaching what do i want to call them organizations maybe not organizations but there was there was there was conversations in the coaching world that we should be doing something for free to support this space and i was like there isn't a should there i mean we can talk about shoulds as coaches all day long but how do we invite people to take part in this um whilst at the same time not make anybody feel guilty for not taking part in this and and i felt a couple of times i read things online where i thought this is shaming coaches to give their work away for free and i'm like i'm not down with that i don't think that's the, the thing to be done i think there was an invitation here to go do you want to be part of something cool do you have the time to spare that you could give to that great and if you don't that's okay because coaches still need to make a living so they can't do everything for free because they you know it's that whole you can't pour from an empty cup thing so they still need to fill their cups and then then they can share and give and and support others and, and you know that's part of what led us not only but part of what led us to create our social impact here at animus we have animus impact led by emma and um, it's a way for us to go, okay, how can we create invitations to our coaching community to support something? So we've just done um, uh, our uh, creating space, which is a, uh, a support, a coaching support for teachers during the pandemic. And, you know, it's, we're inviting you to give your time, if you have it, to be part of this program. And it's a structured program that Emma's created, working with uh, Yes Futures to be, to, to uh, work with teachers and coaches to come together to, to, to support. And it's an invitation and it's not going, as coaches, we should be helping teachers because they're having a, a bad time. It's saying, teachers are having a challenging time. Can you help? If so, come join us because we put something together to make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> Robert, one, one of the things I want to just really acknowledge, you know, it was in there right from something you said really early on, right, about what intrigued you about Matilda was um, the way she worked with people with opposing ideas and opinions. Mm. And I think from then on, I think in that in that rant that you've just, you've, you, your words, not mine, um, uh, <laughs> that you've just, you know, what you've just said, what you can really hear in it is you bringing the spirit of your coaching and leadership into this difficult conversation, right? That that it is really present in society right now, and there'll be plenty of people uh, who are listening who, who, uh, you know, had that had a similar experience uh, a year or so ago um, when you know, particularly with 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 George Floyd's death. Mm. Um, and I want to acknowledge you for that because I think that I, I'm no expert either. Although I have read some books on how to have difficult conversations, right? So I do have some, and I think, you know, for what it's worth, one of the things that we are as coaches is experts in conversation. And it's not every kind of conversation, but that is mostly what I think about and mostly what I work on, right? So there is something that I think we can offer here. And it sounds to me like you're really bringing that, those ideas into this and my feeling is that those are the right ideas to be bringing into these conversations and those you've made a load in the last few minutes of quite sophisticated distinctions um, mm. about how to invite people in and how to create change in a way that and I think you're probably right in a way that will work better than lecturing or shaming or mm. or, or, or shooting everyone. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, it's it, Simon Kavikia talks a lot about shame and the repercussions of shame. And for me, it's like, if you feel shame or embarrassed, it's really hard to get to your humility. It's really hard to get to your, your passion and desire to help if you're wrestling with your own shame. So how do, we, how do we help people to help us by helping them find their way in, you know? And, and you know, as you were saying that, it... it, it made me laugh you know we talked about wraparound and orbits and difficult conversations and saying yes to things I remember you know part of my journey for a while was I was working with Sonia Gill um, at Heads Up um, and one of the the courses that I ran for her or, or with her or for her 
not quite sure of the English there, <laughs> was one called Difficult Conversations, where she was working with senior leaders within education to look at how you have difficult conversations. And I, you know, I learned a lot from her in the delivering of that program around, you know, how do you have those difficult conversations and, and what needs to be part of that? Um, and how do you need to show up to have those difficult conversations? And I think that for me, these conversations, well, when I say these, I'm talking about uh, inclusion, diversity, uh, climate. It's like, how do you show up with an open mind, an open heart to discuss, to hear what people think and say, and to share what you think, but also to be open enough to go, I thought that. Uh, now we're having this, this conversation. I think my thinking was faulty. I think something else now. Let's let's shift into our something else and have that conversation. Uh, and you know, I, Sonia was great at that. Nick's brilliant at that. We we actually did a podcast about uh, this about. Uh, well, it was not about this, but about the word wonderful. I, I often use the word wonderful and I'd used it somewhere and, and Nick had challenged that, that word. Yeah. And um, we then had a podcast conversation about language, mm -hmm. about how we use language and the importance of language. And we, we talked about the, the, the word wonderful, wonderful gate, as we, we uh, affectionately called it. And... Um, to, as we were having this conversation it was going okay I see how you're using that word differently now and I see I, I understand a difference to it now than my original thinking and 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 I'm like we're having this as a public conversation and I think there's something really brilliant about being able to go ah yeah no I see it differently now okay let's have a different conversation now I've seen that but also for the person that you're having that conversation with to be able to let go of how you used to see it mm. and go, Oh, okay, right. Let's, let's restart our conversation as opposed to going, no, but you said this and you said that. And two years ago, you said this, and <laughs> I'm going to hold on to what you yeah. said before, because that, I don't think that's, that helps somebody to shift their narrative. If you're stuck in their old, if you're keeping them stuck in their old narrative, I mean, we swing round, and this goes back to the uh, what you were saying about the, the client has to go back into the outside world after mm. being in a session with you, and the outside world is trying to keep them in their narrative because that's the the space that they know them as being in. So they keep pushing them back because we have to. When somebody in our world changes, it casts a light on where we are in the space. And it forces us to change because they're no longer in that gap. Um, so we, we either try to fill that void or pull them back into that void. And um, I, just, I just think, you know, this is all kind of loops conversations around how we change, how we allow people to change, how we allow people to shift their narrative, how we recognize that when we change our narrative, that sometimes people try to, to push back on that because it might make them feel uncomfortable or, or they lose power within that. You know, if I suddenly turn around to somebody and go, do you know, I actually agree with you. Now there's nothing for them to argue about. And if their, if their narrative was to argue with the world, now they go, well, what's my narrative? Where, where am I in this? And you know, this is all, I just find all of this incredibly fascinating. Yeah, me too. And you know, there's an echo in there of that, of those, you know, it's kind of the, the I don't know much about transactional analysis, but that beautiful or like the, the basic beautiful would be probably if Nick was here, he'd be probably calling me on beautiful. <laughs> I use it a lot. Um, uh, there's the, one of the great things is when you change how you are, if, if you're finding yourself in adult child with someone or whatever, mm. if you can shift back into adult, it's really hard for the other person often to stay in adult or child, whichever they were in. And I think yeah, in some yeah. ways you're talking about that now. I, you know, I want to recommend a book for, I mean, it could be for you, but for anyone who's listening, uh, there's a great book called How to Have Impossible Conversations. It's by James Lindsay and people, Peter Pagosian. And what they've done in that book really is done all the research on how to have these conversations, pulled them together, um, and then like stripped out the research. So the research is all in the back of the book if you want to read more, but you can ah. just read what they've learned from it, which makes it quite snappy. When I read it first, like there's, there's a load of things that you've just said that really remind me of that book, um, you know, which... When I read it, I was kind of reassured for two reasons. 
One was um, that I'd already learned the first, like, let's say two parts of it on my coaching training. Mm. Because really what they're saying is if you actually want to change people's minds, you have to listen to them. Yeah. Like, and that's the first part. And if you can't listen without jumping in, <laughs> then they're not going to change their minds. And the other thing that you just said, you know, really articulately is, is if you allow your, you know, is the, the second thing we can do is role model. So we can role model. If you can role model changing your mind, that makes it acceptable mm. for, for the person you're having the conversation with to change their mind too. And these things aren't, listen, that, that's not necessarily an easy thing to do, right? It's, it's like, it's really hard. I don't know, you know, we could talk for probably for another two hours about why it's hard to change our minds, but it's like, it is a kind of hard thing to do, especially when the conversations get charged. But mm. I think that, um, yeah, there's so much in what you've just said about about how to have this conversation and and i love that you're, you're bringing that 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 question or these conversations and again you've named a few that it could be about diversity or about climate or about you know probably the, there are other ones we could name mm -hmm. you know how do we do it in a way that yeah invites people and actually leads to change <laughs> rather yeah. than makes us feel good which is sometimes yeah. what's going on like yes yeah. i got to tell that person why they're an absolute idiot for the way they're 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 behaving right now yeah yeah and, and 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 part of that is you know <laughs> you know what's the outcome that we want to create and how can we move towards that and what are the milestones that we can place out there to go right this this is what we want to do this is what we want to hear you know the summit being one of those you know uh, we've been in discussions with various people about um uh, uh, a, a class around diversity and coaching and 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 what what that might be and and how that might show up whether that's about unconscious bias or is it or is there something else uh in there I'm, I'm doing a talk later on this year about um about we how how we you know shift our narratives around inclusion and and how we might be unconsciously fixed to a narrative without recognizing or, or, or we but you know we're running a theme but and it's just running in the background and but we haven't challenged it or, or questioned it um and i i think that, that so for me part of this is the more dialogue we have the more conversations we have the more people can have those conversations with others and the bigger the groundswell becomes so we can then go right so we want to do this who's who's with us who's part of our community to make this change to make this difference and also within communities and groups, you know, one of the beauties about group coaching is that there is knowledge in that group that we can tap into that we weren't aware of before. So, you know, on my journey around inclusion and diversity within, within coaching, I've been speaking with uh, Jackie Holder and, you know, she's just this wealth of knowledge and connections and books. And she just kind of, every now and again, she would just say, oh, have you spoken to this person? I'd be like, no, I haven't. This person's awesome. Let's go find them and have a conversation. And, it's, and that's also part of it. It's like having these conversations with different people. And again, how do we pull this together? How do we share this? What do we do with this that creates a difference as opposed to it just creates a conversation? Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, one of the things I'm, you know, I'm going to ask you in a sec, what, like, so I, I know that there'll be people listening who, you know, maybe for many years they've they've been really care cared about diversity. Maybe mm. they've been confronted by it in the last year and realized they want to care more or do more now. Like one of the things that people can do, I think I read it um, maybe in the in the in the Coach Today article, Coaching Today article about that, that there's more of an emphasis on on these conversations in in your podcast now, um, and so people can check that out. And again, we'll put a link to that, and um, that's one thing. But for and maybe you know I don't know if the if the summit you're having is is open to everyone or if it's just an animus yeah, event yeah. but no, be open. If, for people who are who have listened to this this last part of the conversation mm. that we've had and um are want to do their part um or are it, or maybe they just got that feeling that you talked about that feeling of excitement or aliveness or that it's this is a place for them to to step next I guess like what might they do um, now and also like the other part would be what from your conversations so far is there anything you haven't talked about that you've learned that feels like a really important learning from from stepping into this conversation now well I, I think the what they might do and the learning I, I think are intertwined because it's about seeing what other people are doing and having other conversations so there are some events that I've joined and been along to and listened to or I've gone they're all a bit ranty here aren't they 
but I'm like, but if I'm not here listening to them, I can't have a conversation with them and I can't hear their opinions and their point of view. And there are other things I've been to, I've gone, oh my gosh, that's made me think so deeply about my position or about my assumption around their rantiness. <laughs> I go, oh, right. okay, all right. So there's something about how do we, you know, you know, find others to listen to and have conversations with. Um, don't feel that you have to change the world overnight on your own. See if you can find a community to be involved in that are having these conversations. Recognize that people will have their own style of creating change. There'll be those that will want to take uh, action uh, and there'll be those that want to have dialogue. Uh, you know, so, so choose what works for you as opposed to what somebody's telling you you should do. Mm. Um, find your allies and your communities to debate this because sometimes it can be really um, difficult to debate this stuff. You know, because people are... One of the things that I, I remember saying early on was um, one of the challenges about talking about inclusion is recognizing you're going to get it wrong. <laughs> so I know there is language that I'm going to use that isn't the most appropriate language because I haven't learned the language yet. And so I have to accept that I'm going to get some of this stuff wrong. And I have to hope that when I do, that those that have a different idea will share that with me in a way that I can hear it and that I show up in a way to hear it as well. Um, so, so, so I guess that there's all of that. There's, you know, come, come find me on uh, LinkedIn, come find Animus, uh, you know, find out our, our website or our Facebook group, uh, Facebook page rather, um, so you can be part of the conversations when we're having those conversations and our summit will be an open space for people to come to and to to be part of um and then you know when i think about what what could people do i also think about starts there's something about just recognizing what's happened for you so regardless of skin color culture class ability check out you know what's what's your lived experience of this um and just kind of notice that and notice how it makes you feel or what it causes you to do or to not do and kind of go ah, you know get curious about that and then you know allow that curiosity to enable you to have conversations with others mm. Yeah. And again, just, you just, you know, I can hear the, you know, everything you've talked about in your story coming out in the way you're approaching this, these kind of quite, what can be quite charged yeah. issues. Yeah. And, 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 and knowing your intention, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think intention is such an important part in, in what we do. Um, is your intention to find out? Is your intention to support? Is your intention to, to know? So if somebody is reactive to you or that charge overflows, you know, just, just go, here's my intention. This is what I'm, this is what I'm trying to do here. This is what I'm trying to understand here. Uh, and, and not just uh, react to their reaction. Um, because I, because I also think that in that chargedness around these, these sometimes difficult conversations that we fall into, react, react. I don't know what the, the phrase is, but we, you know, I react, you react, we just, and then we, and then and no yeah. one's listening, and then it's, oh. yeah, we're like, we're like this, and you don't understand me, no, you don't understand me, and it's like, wow, okay, let's take a break. Let's step back and go, well, what, what's my intention here? What am I trying to do here? What am I trying to find out? And if I don't know my intention yet, okay, how can I explore within this space to, to get there? Like we would do with our coaching clients. So it's like, you know, come back to being a coach because as a coach, you might have an opinion or a way of doing something, but you go, that's mine. I'm going to bracket that and try and 
facilitate the client to um, uncover their way of doing it or their understanding of, around this. And then in your supervision, you might go, oh, this was my opinion and what I thought, and this is what the client thought. And isn't that interesting? And what do I do with my opposing thinking here? And how do I make sure that's not leaking out or, or whatever it might be or not, not causing me to lead in a conversation? So how do we approach all of, for me, I'm like, how do I approach all of this through a coaching lens? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that in itself, I mean, it's such, that's so, it's, that's just such valuable skills to have, you know, it's why like, um, you know, when I was deciding whether to train as a coach, I didn't know that I was going to end up loving coaching as much as I did, but I was like, well, these are going to be useful, aren't they? And yeah. I think that they really are these skills yeah. that, that yeah. we have in all yeah. kinds of parts of life. As long as we, like we said, you know, uh, nearer the start of the conversation, as long as we integrate them as we're coming back into the world and, and, and use them in the right way. Hmm. I don't want to like there's a part of me that doesn't want to move on from that conversation that we've just had um partly because like we were saying I think before we switched on I have a, like a psychological problem with not moving on from things <laughs> but um but uh I, I want to before I do because I know that it's it's like right at the center of, of your work and what the organization is mm. thinking about is there anything that we we haven't said about that yet before we kind of move well, into another phase of the conversation I don't think so I, I think I, I sort of go I I also don't know what I don't know in this work. So I'm, you know, I have not par partnered, but I there are people around me that I've gone help me understand this, help me find a way through this, um, and I've also uh, sort of leaned into my theatre friends and gone, you're active in this space in theatre. What are you learning there? that I can bring over here because we're we're a younger industry over here yeah. so we haven't learned this stuff or gone through this yet but you've already done this what can I learn from you to bring over here and one of the podcasts that I'm hoping to have later on this year is with a theatre practitioner who's active in this space to talk about what's happening in that space that we can pull on or learn from in our coaching space so how different industries can learn from each other uh to 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 create change or to create awareness so so i guess you know the, the what we haven't well, we just said it so i i'm also on a learning journey uh around this and also finding my own navigation and and also recognizing that i have history that creates a way of thinking for me that I am also checking in on and going, oh, that's interesting. I think like that. Oh, my dad used to say this phrase. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. But I carry that unconsciously into spaces. Hmm, what, what do I want to challenge about that as well? So that kind of we're all learning and growing through this. So I, I in you know, I'm that invitation of, you know, if you can help me in this space, then please reach out and, and help me to think about this, not just in terms of culture or color, but in, in all that kind of inclusive lens. How, how do we have those conversations uh, as well? And it's, you know, one of the things that I, I'm, I'm just, just smiling to myself, I just had a thought about, you know, when it was um, uh, Women of Impact Day, was it Women of Impact Day? Was that, is that the right phrase? Now I'm questioning the phrase that I'm using. There, there was a day and um, <laughs> somebody was saying to me, uh, so, you know, how are you supporting women uh, within your organization? And I was like, have you seen my leadership team? <laughs> have you seen my team? Yeah, again, look at my team, then ask me that question um, because we have a strong female team. Um, and, and that really excites me. It's like, this is, this is cool, right? We've got a strong female team, but, it's, but it hasn't been, let's make a female team. It's like, let's find people who are good at this and let's be open to whoever that might be. And who wants to come and join our space? Right, let's do that. And let's see what we can do with that. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. And yeah, nice, Robert. Thank you. And I want to, I'm aware, you know, we've been talking for a while. Uh, you've got lots of other things to go on to. You know, 
I'm probably moving into the final act of the conversation now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think what what you know I've really heard from you in this conversation is. Actually, let me just say that the thought, I think the thought that was just stalling me there was, was I think, I just think that, that this last part of the conversation that we've had and your, the way that you're approaching this, I think is really useful for any coach who is on some level thinking about being an activist. Hmm. And that's the, that's the link that you drew with the climate, um, the climate change, the people who are passionate about climate change and are also coaches. And it's just a thorny thing to be an activist whilst trying to be a coach. I just think that's a really tricky thing to do because of all the things that we've just been talking about. But I just want to really flag that up for people who are listeners because I've thought about the societal narratives really that we have around a lot of these conversations quite a lot. And I think it's when it comes to things like activism uh, and, and really any cause that we are really passionate about, it is very easy for us to get sidetracked out of all the skills we know are really useful mm. which we have learned from coaching and from relating to people and so i just think that that what you've said has been has included a lot of or this last part of the conversation has included a lot for for, for people who are thinking about that so thank you for that mm. and, and then i guess i want to ask like we've heard about you as the leader um it's been great to do that and i think we just had this beautiful introduction to you as the thought leader as well as as how you're thinking about and how you're bringing your all your values and what you love about coaching to this hmm. well, you know one of the the biggest kind of societal conversations of today i think you said before that you're not really doing much training anymore and i just wondered if you know that there's if there's just before we finish if there's you know what place do these things that you clearly love like coaching and training hmm. have for you as a practitioner now at this stage in your work it's, it's really interesting. So when I, it took me a while, <clears throat> excuse me, it took me a while to get out of the training room. So, <laughs> so as I was bringing in more and more trainers to, to, to do, uh, now let me re- rephrase that. So as the training team grew, my responsibility became, became less of delivering the training and supporting that training team. And it became very evident to me that in order to do that and to have the right focus, I needed to step out of the training space. Um, And that took me a while. I, I had a real push and pull with that because I was like, but I love, I love this thing of, of training. So why would I not do that? And I, I sort of had that conversation about, but you're going to have a bigger impact on this thing that you love if you're supporting the people that are doing the thing to do it to, the, to their highest uh, potential, possibility, skill, ability. Um, so, so yeah, so it took me a while, but what, what I realised was that then it, by not doing that piece, I could focus on other things. I could give that energy and attention that, that exists within the training space in other spaces. And there was a real recognition of the importance of that. So I then didn't allow myself to come back into that space. Um, but I, I guess that all the, th- uh, how do I explain this? All the things that I do as a trainer still exist within me. So when working with a team, having a conversation about a a project, all those facilitation and training skills are still very on the surface. I'm still kind of going, okay, so how, so it's it's almost like uh, the, the leader has become the trainer that it's like lead through training, lead through coaching, leading through dialogue. So it's, it's, it's kind of sitting in, in those spaces. And it might be that there'll come a time where I'll go, do you know, I want to train around this thing here that's become important for me. So there might come a time when it, it might be about inclusion or it, it might be about narrative or whatever the next thing that's coming down the line that I haven't noticed yet, that I go, actually, oh, there's something here I want to kind of talk about. Um, 
know, there's something very interesting for me about leadership and being a leader and navigating leadership that, I'm, that I find fascinating and challenging and beautiful um, and exhilarating all at the same time. And I think there's something there for me as well about you know, how to enable people to become better leaders. And it might just be something that I do with my team, but it might be something that then grows out into something else um, there as well. But I, I, I also sort of go, um, I'm all right letting it go because I don't know when it's going to swing back. So, you know, I, mm-hmm. I, I stopped performing, um, I don't know, 10 years ago. Somebody will probably challenge me on that. But I stopped performing uh, as a profession. But um, my, um, a, a group uh, that, oh, how do I explain this? So, um, I'm just going to throw loads of first names out there just, just to try and, try and uh, get my head around this. So a friend of ours, Che, he runs a, a charity night called uh, Revolution, and it's where he gets uh, artists together. He's a, he's a writer, director, uh, uh, person. So he gets all these people that he knows, these famous people, and his students, and they do performances, and they're supported by Steve, um, and, and they make these wonderful nights happen. And then um, Steve every now and again we'll go hey uh, let's let's pull one of our old sketches together and redo it so then myself and Isaac will meet with Steve and we'll get into a rehearsal room mm-hmm. and we'll, we'll recreate one of our old sketches and then we'll perform that at one of these revolution events and so it's like I don't perform anymore but maybe once a year or every two years there'll be a moment of of performance that will kind of swing back so I kind of go nah. I can kind of swing back into this thing. Um, I just don't do it as as fast as I used to, and I can't do it for as long as I used to. Because the, the the work we did was such high paced uh, work, we kind of go, yeah, we couldn't do that again. But anyway, <laughs> um, so I guess there's a there's a bit of me that goes that 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 may come back around, and you know we're we're producing a uh, an advanced coaching course this year. And there may be bits on that, it might be lectures on that that I might be uh, in, involved in. But I guess it just, just the, the, the way in which it happens will shift and the way in which I work will, will shift. Yeah. And, and what's clear is, as we said, we said a couple of times in this conversation, you know, you haven't left behind those bits from before, right? They're, mm. they're obviously present in, in, in you in all kinds of ways, in I'm sure all, all the work you do and the conversations you have. Um, if and it's could... also about it's also about recognizing sorry to interrupt you no, it's no, no, it's great. In, in recognizing when it's time to to move from something mm. or to level up from something or to go sideways from something and not just do the same thing because that's what you do yeah and go well it's gonna what, what's another opportunity or possibility here and yes i may have to say no to some things in order to do this but let's explore what this is and, and see what that's about. I think that's that, that's part of me leaving the training space was going, well, okay, I want to say yes to this. And in order to say yes to this, I need, I need space. You know, one of the, the things that I noticed that some new coaches and maybe not so new coaches do is they try to do everything all the time. And it's like, you have to create space for things to emerge. You have to have space to actually get things done. And then you can do some of that stuff later on down the line. So you don't have to do it all right now. Yeah. And maybe that's one of the things, but like I was, you know, I was about to ask, so you're already, you know, something that this is what wants to emerge in the conversation, right? Going back to what we said before, you know, I was going to ask, you've seen lots of coaches come through Animus now. I I don't know how many it is, but probably thousands, uh, you know, um, in the, in the time that you've been there and you've, you've spoken about the community. So you're still in touch with them and you're still hearing from them you know for coaches who are out there one of those things it sounds like is don't try and do everything at once right you have to leave some space for Mm. what might what might appear but what are the other things that that you think are most important for coaches to remember as they navigate you know their journey after their training (laughs) okay well we're we're here (laughs) i think so one to recognize that you've done your training but that isn't the end of the journey 
um, that in some ways learning the skills of coaching is only the beginning of the journey um so so don't feel that that right i've done the thing right now let me go and have a business or or whatever that might be go right i I am part way through a journey and i've learned the skills and now i need to apply these skills um i would say uh don't get caught up in the world of this is how you build a business. This is how you build a six figure business. This is how you do this. You know, just, just check in. What is it you want to do? Because there are lots of people telling us how to build a six figure business, but do you actually want a six figure business? And what does that even mean to you? So there's something about what is it that you want from your work? You know, what, what's that? Um, we, we talk about uh, the acronym life, what's the lifestyle, what's the impact, what's the finances, what's the emotion that you want from the work that you do. And to really take time to go, well, what is this? And what's the time frame that this might emerge over? And yes, you might go, how can I condense that time frame? I, I was talking to, um, was it Steve Chandler? I think it was Steve Chandler. It might not have been, but somebody saying, you know, I told somebody, here's my plan. I'm going to do this plan in uh, five years. And they said, well, why don't you do it in five months? Or why don't you do it today? Why are you waiting five years? So there's, you know, yeah, we can condense our plans, but think about what you actually want to do. Uh, and, and, and be careful of looking around, seeing what other coaches are saying they are doing and thinking that's that's what you should do. Um, do what you want to do as a as a coach and be and coach you have to coach if you're not coaching you're not coaching you're not building your skills so whether you have to do that whether you need to keep your job and do it in the evenings or the weekends until you build up that enough people that are paying you at the price that enables you to leave that job then do it that way whether it's you need two or three jobs uh, to to make that work whether you're doing coaching and running workshops, whether you're doing coaching and the thing that you used to do at the same time to, to make that work. Um, but don't, don't get caught up in the shiny, shiny of Instagram um, ads about <laughs> what, what you should be doing um, because you, you can catch yourself doing a, a social media course and then a LinkedIn course and then a marketing course, and then a copywriting course, and you, you're doing all of this stuff, but you're not actually coaching. So you've got to stay coaching. Um, and, and find people that are on that journey with you that you can ask questions about how they got to where they got to, but have a dialogue with them um, and a conversation, which is what I love about the Animus community is because we've got over 3,000 members of that community. And they're all on completely different stages of that journey. And so people can go, I'm running a workshop for a, a, a corporate. Can I have a chat with somebody who's done this before so I can think about my, my, my costs, my fees? And somebody will go, yeah, I, I, this is what I do. Let's have a chat. Um, or, or somebody will go, I'm, I'm thinking about running something or doing something or creating something. And people can have a, a, a chat with them around that. I think the other thing is, I'd say, is it's okay to say no. If somebody says, do you want to join my membership group? You can say, no, I don't. Or you can say, yes, this is the right thing for me right now. Um, just, you know, don't, don't feel that there are, there are any musts here. Um, and, and, and read some books about how to have a business um, and recognize the journey. I was having a conversation with, who was I having? Maybe this was uh, Serona. And we were talking about, this idea that when you go, when you learn to be a chef, you don't leave chef school or chef university, or wherever it might be, and go, right, I'm now going to be the head chef there. You go, there are stages that I need to work through and things that I need to do in order to make this happen. It's the same when you leave drama school, you don't go, I'm going to be the next now sometimes these things happen of course you know i know people that before they've left drama school they're in the the 
biggest hit ever. And you're going, how did that happen? So there are anomalies to this. But when you leave drama school, you go, right, so I, I need to go, I need to get some work. I'll be doing some other things at the same time. I'll build up my practice. I'll build up my reputation. And then I get to a point where work is offered to me and I don't need to go out and, and look for that work. And then I get to the point where I need somebody to manage that work. And then I get to the point where I need a team around me. And we go, there is a journey that we go through on this. And I think for new coaches to recognize that there is that journey with coaching and to, to recognize that in oneself and go, what are the skills that I already have that will help me with that journey? And what are the skills that I don't have that I might need to learn or I need support with to help build me in that journey? Yeah, Robert, so much wisdom in there. Um, uh, yeah, glad I asked that question or that the, the question wanted to be asked. Mm. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. So yeah. I just before we finish, all right, you know, I want to say a big thank you, but is there anything you want to, to say or share before, before we bring the conversation to a close? Well, I, I, th I also want to say thank you, because this has been fascinating for me to kind of relive my experience and relive that, that, that sort of story. I'm sort of going, I'm excited to listen back to it, to hear what I said and to go, <laughs> oh, wow, OK, yeah, that, that's interesting. And what, what is that journey into to, to capture that? Because I don't often capture the journey because I'm so kind of, right, it's the next thing. It's the next thing that's happened. Let's, let's let that go. Um, but I think there's something really interesting to, to re I'm, you know, I'm a great reflector, so I daily reflect, but I don't necessarily yearly reflect or time career reflect in, in this way. So I think it's been really useful for me. And I think it would be, I would offer it to others to take time to reflect on your journeys, to notice how far you've come, like we would do with our, our uh, coaches. Um, yeah, and it's it's been you know, Robbie, it's been great just just kind of sitting having this this conversation with you. It's been just like I, I just looked at the time and I was like, you were saying it's coming close to the end of our time together. And I was like, no, it's not. We we only just started, but yeah, we've been here a while and it's been yeah. brilliant. Well, let's hope the listeners, I'm sure they will have had that same feeling that you do, because I feel the same. I'm like, wait a second, you know, and you say it's like, yeah, it's been well, it's been an absolute pleasure for me. And um, you know. So, you know, the reflector in you is clear because of the way you speak and think. And it's been a total pleasure to be there. And we could have absolutely done. I could have absolutely asked enough questions for another two hours. So thanks for mm -hmm. making the time for this. Um, I know people will get a huge amount of it. We'll put links to you and the different things we've mentioned in this show um, at thecoachesjourney.com. And yeah, just other, other than that, like, yeah, big thank you, Robert. Not just for this, but for all the work you're doing for the, for the coaching industry. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I guess my last thing is I want to just kind of recognize that I, I, this isn't just me. It's a team. I yeah. do this with a team and uh, my team are fabulous. And uh, uh, the work that I'm able to do is because of um, that team. You know, that includes Nick as, as in that conversation or in that statement. But because of them, I'm able to do this work and we're able as an organization to do this work. So I just want to make sure I name check my team. Yeah. And you've, you have also, I should say you have throughout like the number of people, like you've, I think, you know, it's beautiful to do and big high five to, to that team uh, as well. But um, yeah, you've, you've been doing that all the way through too. Don't worry. Thanks so much, Robert. Cheers. Thank you.